Um, we wish to acknowledge the land on which the Fields Institute operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat and Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Professor Jan Hong Wu, who will open this session. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very glad that actually we have one of the uh, active research, uh, Professor Zulin Chu, come us to really start some relatively new chapter of this network we feel we want to move on uh, to launch the network to touch on some other important issues one of the important part is the vector diseases in particular uh, the uh, the mosquito bone diseases and uh, the chill with uh, uh, doctor study and uh, one of the best scientists in the field james uh, hammond from tunan uh, she is now a uh, faculty member at University of Texas in San Antonio. And uh, Julian today is going to talk about a important uh, genetic uh, control issues really to a watch control of the Moscow, uh, mosquito bone diseases. So, uh, Dr. Chiu, thank you again for joining us. Thanks. Let me start sharing. Can you see my screen? Yes, very well. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Wu, for the nice introduction and for having me here. It's my uh, great pleasure to share our recent work on modeling Wolbachia as a mosquito control. Okay. So we know that mosquito-borne disease have caused uh, great suffering in human beings. Right? So here I list uh, three of them. So dengue fever, it can cause flu-like illness. Some of the severe case may be life-threatening. For chikungunya, it can cause long-term joint pain that can persist for months. For Zika, uh, infection during women's pregnancy may lead to some birth defect uh, in the baby. So specifically, it's called microcephaly, so where the head size in the newborn is much smaller than it's supposed to be. So for these uh, mosquito-borne disease, uh, the uh, reliable um, vaccination is still under development. So one of the major mitigation approaches is to target the vector. The primary vector is a species of mosquito called Aedes aegypti. So here is our friendly Aedes aegypti, and people have come up with many ways to kill them. So for example, use the uh, insecticide spray. Right. You can do uh, level control, such as removing the breeding habitats, so those great tires from the backyard. And then the last one that I put here is a biological control, sterile insect technique. So this technique has been uh, used for controlling other insects as well. So for mosquitoes, people process the sterilized male in the lab. They release them to the field, and when they mate with the natural females, uh, there will be no natural offspring reproduced. So all of these approaches are aim, aiming to uh, really, uh, reduce the population size. Well, unfortunately, um, most of the program require long-term mitigation program to maintain the effectiveness over the time. So often the case when you stop the program, the mosquito may come back later. So people are looking for a more sustainable um, mosquito control. So this is where uh, the Wolbachia thing comes in. So Wolbachia, the pathogen itself, is a natural bacteria that's been found in many insect species, including uh, some mosquito species, and it can block disease transmission to human. So here is a typical uh, transmission cycle for mosquito-borne disease. So we have a mosquito, it can, it can transmit um, the virus, say dengue virus, from a sick person to a healthy person through mosquito bites. If the mosquito now is simultaneously uh, infected with the dengue virus and the Wolbachia bacteria, like here, it's no longer able to pass the infection among the population. So in other words, we don't kill the mosquitoes in this strategy. They're still flying around, but like they are no longer the vector for this transmission cycle. Well, ideally, if mosquitoes are always this infection, then there will be no transmission. Well, um, for, before Aedes aegypti mosquito, it's not naturally infected with this uh, Wolbachia 
bacteria. And to create this infection in the mosquitoes, um, people need to manually release this uh, infection to the field mosquito population. And within the mosquito population, the Wolbachia infection can be maternally transmitted from generation to generation. So in some sense, this can be a self-sustainable uh, self approach um, like compared to the other uh, classical controls that we have uh, mentioned. And in fact, many field trials has been uh, implemented around the world to uh, test out their efficacy for controlling the, mainly the dengue and Zika epidemic. And people do reports on uh, promising uh, results in terms of uh, cutting down the, uh, the cases for the mosquito-borne disease. So when we talk about fuel release, one main question we want to ask is how many mosquitoes we want to release, right? So if we only release one mosquito, it's not going to save the world. And we know that this Wolbachia infection is difficult to sustain itself in the field because the infection can lead to some fitness costs in the mosquitoes. So the Wolbachia infected females, they may lead, lead, live a shorter lifespan and it may produce a fewer number of uh, offspring. So depending on what strain of Wolbachia you use to infect the female mosquitoes, um, they have different type of uh, fitness cost. So if we only introduce small amount of infection, they cannot uh, come like they can when they compete with the natural ones, they're not going to win. Right? So they will the infection will be wiped out by the natural population. And in fact, when people test out this strategy in the lab, like in the cage experiments where the mosquito are boxed in the in the, in the, in the cage. And they figure that the infection level needs to exceed a threshold level in order for the infection to uh, sustain in the population. So our goal here is to use our mathematical tools and try to capture this threshold uh, condition for this Wolbachia strategy. And in particular, the threshold will be realized as a fraction of infection. Right, so we want to find this theta value above that. The infection will grow and spread out and maintain at a high infection level, and below that threshold, infection will die out. Okay. So our initial model contains a system of nine ODEs, and as we'll see in a second, um, this system contains a complex uh, transmission cycle for the Wolbachia infection. And then we want to incorporate spatial dynamics, and we found it's challenging to analyze like a large system of PDs directly. So prep us, to prep us for a spatial extension, our later work, uh, we, in our later work, we do the model reduction. So we simplify the full system to a reduced two OD system and maintain some key uh, analytical properties. And then recently we extend this spatial model based on this reduced model. And for all these models, our central question here is what is the threshold condition, right? For, Wolbachia invasion happens in the mosquito population. And for example, and also how the spatial dynamic may affect uh, this threshold criteria. Okay, so let's look at our uh, initial model here. So as we mentioned that uh, Wolbachia is, uh, we have this maternal transmission among the mosquitoes and they pass from infected mothers to the offspring. So here is a diagram showing how it works. So we have female mosquitoes here and male mosquito here. And when they mate, they produce offspring on the right-hand side. So when, they, when both parents are uninfected, right, the offspring is uninfected. And in the bottom two rows, when the female is infected, and regardless of the infection status for the male, the offspring is infected up to a high percentage here. That depends on the strain of the Wolbachia. A special case is when only the male mosquito is infected, right? The female is not, then the female will only produce a non-viable offspring. So essentially no offspring here from this scenario. So this is, in, this is called the Wolbachia-induced uh, cytoplas cytoplasmic incompatibility between the eggs and the sperm here, okay? And then we also refer the fraction of infection here in the bottom two cases as the maternal transmission rate. So that's a number between zero and one. And in particular, the strain that we focus on for this study is the double male strain of Wolbachia. 
and the maternal transmission rate is very high, like almost 99%. Okay. So based on this transmission dynamic, we do this compartmental model. So we partition, we do the partition on the mosquito population depending on their life cycles. All right. So we have male mosquito and female mosquito. And when they mate, the female become pregnant. So we have this pregnant stage for the mated females. They produce offspring in the water, right? So we have eggs, larvae, and the pupae, and they and then they emerged from the water stage and becoming adults. So we have uh, the upper rows uh, boxes, they're uninfected cohort, and we have the infected cohort in the bottom. Right? So the previous special case for the no offspring case, so that is if we have infected male here and uninfected female. Right? So we will have a pregnant but sterile female, and they will produce like no offspring here. And when female is infected, they are infected, right? And then they produce a high fraction of infected offspring with a potential leakage here towards the uninfected uh, route here. So we include the pregnant stage here explicitly, explicitly for this model is because typically um, like female only mate successfully once with the male in their lifespan. So when they mate, they store the sperm in their body, and then um, then they take blood meal to um, from the human beings and to neutralize the eggs, and then they produce um, batches of eggs uh, here and there without any contact from the uh, males. So we have this separate stage here. So our goal is this is our model. Right. And then our goal here is to study the threshold condition. So the first quantity we study is the basic reproduction number, the R0. Right. So we know that R0 is given one infected individual, how many um, infected in infections it can create, right? given the population is fully susceptible. And typically, it can be used as a threshold condition for disease outbreak. So if one infection creates more than one, then the infection spreads out, and otherwise the infection will die out. So for example, for the flu, uh, um, the influenza, the um, R0 is between like one and two. For HIV, which is a sexually transmitted uh, disease, the R0 is around four. And for airborne disease such as measles, it's more infectious and the R0 can be very huge. And for our Wolbachia transmission, right, we can consider the Wolbachia infection as a disease for mosquitoes. And within the mosquito population, it has this maternal transmission. So our, uh, so we want to find out what's the R0 for this Wolbachia, like this mosquito disease. So we follow the uh, standard next generation matrix approach and we derive the expression for the R0. And then when we evaluate this expression at the baseline, parameter values, um, it's around 0.7 and it's less than one. So we wonder if um, there's, we cannot really establish this infection in the mosquitoes. Well, first of all, I would say this result, like less than one is not that surprising uh, because we do know that the Wolbachia infection uh, creates this fitness cost, right? So it does not naturally appear in the uh, in, the, in, the, in the mosquito population. So it cannot survive, it's less than one. But however, we also realized that the R0 is only a good approximation uh, for predicting the outbreak if we only at the disease, we, if only we are near the disease-free steady state, if we are just assign a small perturbation around the, the, the disease-free state. So unlike, other human disease, say dengue virus, usually you have small outbreak and then it peaks. For Wolbachia, we can release lots of mosquitoes at once, right? So we can, we can create a scenario where we are already far from the disease-free steady state. So to check the threshold, we do the bifurcation analysis on the system. So we see this nice backward bifurcation um, for the system. So the x-axis, uh, we have the R0, on the y-axis is a fraction of infection. So we have three state, states here. We have a stable disease-free steady state. We have a high infection endemic state, which is stable. And we have an, uh, an, another endemic state that is unstable and it connects these two, right? So 
Now we see that this unstable steady state is acting like a threshold condition. So if we can bring our infection level, the initial infection level about that uh, level, then the infection will grow and uh, approach to this stable state, right? And below that, the infection will die out. So the at the this vertical line is our baseline scenario where my R0 is around 0.7, and we see that the corresponding threshold level is around 30%. Right, so this is our initial attempt trying to uh, capture that threshold condition. And then, as I mentioned that we do want to consider the spatial dynamics, right? And we have that big system of nine ODs and we, we don't like it, right? So we want to first simplify it and see if we can capture the absolute uh, uh, essence in our model without you know, dealing with a large system. So we consider our model reduction um, approach. So we do the model reduction using like a step-by-step -step approach. And um, at each step, we consider, uh, we, we derive the approximated um, model uh, by considering many two quantities. So the first quantity is the time scale of one generation. So that is, we have this um, compartmental model that tracks the life cycle of a mosquito. So we want to preserve the time scale of this life cycle. And the second quantity is we want to preserve the number of new offspring that's generated within that one life cycle. Okay, so let's start with the first step. So the firstly, we uh, state that we're going to remove the aquatic stage, right? So because our goal is to reduce the number of variables in the system and the aquatic mosquitoes, they don't directly contribute the, uh, the, to the infection. So we saw there's a lot logic place to start. So we want to uh, uh, match the time scale, right? So we know that mosquitoes, they spend long time in the aquatic stage, like there's a delay there. So in the full model, our life cycle, the span of the time scale for the life cycle is the time they spend in the water plus the time they are adults. Right, that's the life, life, life cycle. And then in the reduced model, when we don't track this aquatic stage here, then this is our, we need to adjust the death rate here. So that's the whole lifespan match. And then we need to define the new um, birth rate that comes directly from the pregnant stage to the single adult stage. Right? So, and we considered, we want to preserve the number of new offspring. So we consider these two quantities that we call next generation numbers. So for example, the G0U is given one uninfected individual, how many new uh, uninfected individual that it can produce through one life cycle. So it's like the next generation factor here per generation. And then we also have G0U that's for the infected cohorts. So we derive say the next generation number for the uninfected population here. So for example, we start our cycle at the single female stage, right? So uh, with some probability, this uninfected female will survive and become pregnant. So that's, that's this fraction for. And then at the pregnant stage, the female produce X at this rate. And then for how much time? For one over the mu amount of time. So that's the total number of offspring that the female produce. And then among these offspring, only a fraction of them will survive, right? Survive and uh, emerge and become adults. So that's a fraction of survival um, from that aquatic stage. And then half of them, the BF, become female. So when we multiply all these factors together, it gives us like one female creates that many new females. We derive the similar quantity for the reduced model, like without this aquatic stage. And then we can solve our adjusted birth rate from this equality. So by having these two adjustments, right, we preserve the time scale of one mosquito life cycle, and we, per and we preserve the number, the amount of change that happens within that one generation. So we have seven ODs. And now next, we combine, we, to further reduce the uh, variables, we combine the infection groups among the female mosquitoes. So um, the, the, the reason will be that typically female mate 
pretty soon after they emerge from the water stage. So they spend a relatively short amount of time in this single stage, right? So we would combine the single stage with the pregnant stage if we want to further simplify the model. And we still consider our next generation factor here. So we derive that quantity for the seven and we derive the quantity for the reduced four ODE model. And we solve this adjusted uh, birth rate here. And then lastly, we want to remove the males here because at the end of the day, it's the female mosquitoes that bite and transmit the virus to humans. So we, would, we need to approximate this fraction of only fact is males here in the system such that the female and the male part are decoupled. So we observe that we can approximate this fraction of uninfected males by this fraction of uninfected females uh, up, uh, like with this uh, uh, adjusted coefficients in the front. And then with that approximation, this is our reduced 2 OD model. We see that we have this complex um, birth term here in the front. And then these parameters in our reduced models, since we are doing this reduction using a step-by-step -step approach, so we keep track uh, of the parameter transformation at each step. So these new parameters, they are all defined in terms of the original parameters from the full model, which may have more uh, biological interpretation. And now we want to ask, right? So, so what, right? We have this reduced model. How does that compare to the full model? We have made lots of approximation here. So specifically, we check the, the quantities related to threshold, so the R0 and our bifurcation curves. So for the R0, we derive that for all our reduced models, the nine, the seven, the four, and two ODs. And we see that upon the parameter transformation that we track along the along the reduction process, um, the reduction, the basic reproduction number are exactly equivalent between the full model and all the reduced model. As for the threshold condition, so this is our backward bifurcation for the full model that we see before, right? And we do that for all the reduced models here. And we see that they're closely um, matched with each other. So in fact, the, the disease-free state and the high infection state, they exactly match here when we talk about the fraction of infection in the females. And then the middle unstable state, that's our threshold condition. You cannot really tell any discrepancy using the eyeball norm, but like if you really zoom in and you will see that there's, there, there, there is some small discrepancy between the threshold. So for the full model and two OD model, the discrepancy is less than 1%. So we, we say that because just taking, consider all the approximation and assumptions that we make along the way, we feel like this amount of error is still pretty tolerable and uh, we are happy with the behavior of our reduced to OD model. So now we have our two OD model and we're ready for uh, studying our spatial model that based on this 2OD. So for the rest of the uh, talk, I will be focusing on um, our, our, our spatial model and how we analyze the threshold condition here. Right, so, well, I, first of all, why we need spatial model, right? So if we, if we can do everything with the OD, why bother we introduce more complexity in our model? So I want to emphasize that, well, we do need that. So first, um, there is some heter spatial heterogeneity here in the field. Like mosquito, they are flying around. They don't stay put, right? And then you will imagine that at, if you do the field release, right? So near the release center, you have high infection rate. Near the edge of, near the, edge of the release area, you may have pretty minimal infection rate. So you have this heterogeneity in the distribution of the infection here that caused by the mosquito diffusion. And also mosquito can migrate in or out of the release area. So people have actually reported that in this uh, field trials from 2013 in Australia, people observed that the infection can collapse because there are some uninfected mosquitoes migrating into the release area from the nearby region. And that flux um, make the infection collapse. So, for modeling wise, we can model the dispersion or the diffusion using this uh, diffusion matrix 
here. So this is this represents the on-directional random walk-like movements here. For the migration or the advection, we can use this um, advection term here for um, more directional movements. So these are the spatial models, um, the arguments from our biological intuition. Right? We have mosquito flights. And also, uh, we, uh, I want to point out that if we don't consider the spatial dynamics, it may actually create uh, misleading predictions in terms of whether the Wolbachia invasion will happen or not. So this, I will just show you a, a simple example here. So this is a, a spatial diffusion term right, added to the ODE model. So on the left, I simulate a field release of a, a step distribution. So the X dimension is our releasing field, the spatial dimension, and Y axis is my fraction of infection. So I introduced like a step distribution of infected mosquitoes and the release, uh, the infection rate at the release center is slightly above the OD threshold that we identified before. And we let it run and we see that, well, the invasion happens, right? The infection grow and then expand outward like a traveling wave solution. Another, step, uh, another simulation where I have much higher infection rate at the release center and I have much smaller support here. And we see that, well, in this case, the infection cannot sustain itself and it collapse. So we see that in, when, we, when, when having the spatial dimension um, in the system, the OD threshold is no longer a valid um, criteria for predicting whether the, 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 the invasion would happen or not. Right? We need to consider the spatial dimension here. So let's look at the model here. So this is my uh, extended spatial model with the diffusion coefficient D1 and, <clears throat> D1 and D2 here for the uninfected infected cohorts. And then to simplify the look, we do the non-dimensionalization non using the following transform. So we introduce the ratio of the diffusion coefficients here. And then we have the diffusion coefficient for the wild is uh, normalized to be one. And this is the diffusion ratio here. So we have uninfected and infected cohorts. So for this model, um, specifically, we consider the following uh, initial condition. So our goal is to study whether the Wobaka can invade into the natural population, right? And we only study uh, the local release of infection with compact support. So what does that mean is, imagine people doing field release, they have these infected mosquitoes with them in the cage and then bring the cage to the top of the mountain and release them to the air, right? That's the, the field, field release too. And then these release happened only in this local region. So we translate in the modeling framework, we only consider an initial introduction of infection with compact support. And we emphasize that this is a more biologically relevant scenario. Okay, so theoretically speaking, you can have a release profile of different shapes, right? So you can have like the step distribution of release. You can have triangular shape release, or you can have the funny elliptical shape release, right? And we to now with the spatial with the spatial dimension, we need to define what do we mean by threshold condition, right? So for example, for the step release, we can parameterize the threshold as a function of the infection rate at the center. That is the height right, of the shape. So we can figure out a threshold height such that above this number, the infection established, above that number, below that number, the infection collapse. And we can do that. We can find the threshold height for the triangle, threshold height for the ellipse. We see that no matter what shapes we use, right, at the threshold height, and they all evolve and converge to this um, bubble-shaped profile that is outlined by my magenta curve here. Right? And this is because at the end of the day, this is a reaction diffusion system, right? So there are two competing forces in the system here. You have um, the reaction part, that is the growth part that push the infection curve upward. You have the diffusion part that helps spread out the infection to a nearby region. So the, the critical, the, the bubble here, the, this bubble shape here is really trying to adjust its location at each, each, each spatial location between these two competing forces. 
right? And so we will going to identify our threshold condition using this bubble shape. And we call this critical bubble here. For convenience, we call the peak infection level as the PDE threshold. So the threshold condition that we are trying to identify, it's an unstable state for the system and it's a very delicate balance between these two competing dynamics. Okay, so again, we, we have two PD and because of the complexity in our reaction part, we say, okay, we want to further simplify it. So that's more manageable um, for our analytical study. So to further simplify it, we introduced the um, variable P that's for the fraction of infection. And we assume, we have to make some assumption here. We assume that the population size is near the maximum level. That is one minus BD over A term here. So we, in other words, we assume that the deviation from this maximum level is small. This epsilon is small. And we do the uh, perturbation analysis uh, around this uh, state and we obtain this reduced 1PD approximation. So we see that this reduced 1PD system um, equation is still a bistable, system, bistable equation here, right? We have the zero and one here. And then the P0 is an unstable state that uh, con is corresponding to the unstable state from these uh, two um, equation system. And we have this um, fractional, um, polynomial here in the front. And one caveat is, uh, I want to point out here is, um, the 1PD system is only a good approximation when this assumption is satisfied, right? So if you want to simulate, say, a large field release, we release lots of infected mosquitoes to the field, and then um, like obviously the total population size will be way above that capacity. And for that purpose, you will want to go, to go back to the more detailed model for simulation. So we start simplified model. Well, it's not a model, but for the simplified equation, I will say, we can set the right-hand side to be zero and we impose the Neumann boundary condition at the peak here and at the boundary here. And then um, we can derive the P star, the threshold and the critical bubble curve uh, without too much uh, effort here. So I just include the conclusion here for a reference. So this is uh, analytically, we, we call it an analytical approach, but we do make strong assumption. So we do can study, uh, we, we do can study the, uh, the full 2PD system numerically, and we can check how much error we have made along the process. So to identify that critical bubble numerically, we uh, do this, we simulate a point release. That is on the left, I stand at the release, cent release center, right? And I release amount of infection such that I aim for this uh, fraction of infection here, say P star. And I keep monitoring the fraction of infection and the center, right? If it's below that, I will keep, I'll release more. So I fix the infection rate at the release center and then the infection front, the bubble will gradually uh, form its shape, right? And then now I stop release. So we argue that if this P start, if the P2 that we set is less than the threshold level, when, once we stop release, right, it will collapse. If it's above that P start, then the infection will grow. So we iterating between the infection rate that we aim at the center, and then we can identify a, an approximation for P star that can, once the uh, release stopped, it can uh, maintain its shape for some time. So as you may imagine, uh, we are doing, this approach can be very expensive um, because we are solving this uh, PD system many, many times. Then we compare uh, the results here, right? For the analytical approach and the numerical approach. So this, is the um, critical bubble that we identify using the two approaches. So we see that uh, for the most of the part, they are, they are close to each other. The largest discrepancy happens near the uh, release center here, right? And um, the quantity, the, the value is um, showing up here and here. So relatively the discrepancy is less than 1%. 
So we see that they're pretty close to each other. And then we vary the D coefficient here. So D is the uh, ratio that for the diffusion coefficient, right? So if we increase the D parameter here, that is, um, that is the, the, the diffusion, that is the infected mosquitoes are more dispersive than the uninfected mosquitoes. So we see that in that case, the threshold we need for the successful invasion is lowered. And then on the right, the bubble, when we have faster diffusion for uh, infected mosquitoes, the bubble become flatter and have this flatter tail here. And if we compare these PD threshold with the one that we identified before. So this number is a bit different because we have assumed like a perfect maternal transmission there. Um, but you, when you compare the value here, you will see that um, it, these are two very, very different threshold conditions here. Okay, so we mentioned that no matter, uh, we, have, we, we can have different spatial distribution of infection, right? We can have a step, triangle, and lips, and they all converge to my critical bubble shape here. So we wonder like if there's something special with this critical bubble compared to other spatial shapes, right? So, um, so for that, we are going to first study the step uh, shapes of release. So for example, here for each width of the, uh, of, for each like width of the step, we can identify its threshold height. And then for different widths, we can identify, identify different threshold heights. So these are a sequence of threshold steps here. And then the magenta line is the bubble that we identify. So we compare these bunch of uh, shapes here. Um, and then to compare them, we, 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 we integrate the area under the curve. So biologically speaking, this means like um, the number of infected mosquitoes we need to release, right? So on the right, the curve on the top here represents the area, the area under the curve for different step widths. We see that the number, the release number first decrease, hit a sweet spot around 30 and then it bounced back. So the, 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 the minimal amount of uh, infected mosquitoes needed is around with 30. So that's this step here. And then the horizontal line in the bottom, that's the uh, area under the critical bubble. And we see that uh, no matter how we adjust the width of the steps, they, it's always above my critical bubble level. We repeat this process for other different uh, other shapes. So we have threshold triangles here. We have the threshold ellipse here. And then we compute all the areas. So these three curves on the top are the uh, areas for the three different shapes. They have the similar trends, right? First decrease, hit the Swiss bob, and then bounce back. And then they all are above my uh, area for the uh, critical bubble. So we conjecture that our critical bubble is an optimal scenario for, is an optimal scenario for field release, meaning that um, if we can assign the infection, if, if, we, if we can distribute the amount of infection using this bubble shape, then it will be, it will require the least amount of mosquitoes, right, to, for, to establish that invasion. Uh, that's only our conjecture. We're uh, not, we are not able to really prove it uh, rigorously, okay? But what, what, one thing that we can actually um, tell from this uh, study is, we know that critical bubble is nice, like that's an optimal spatial distribution, but I, I, we know that it's not practical, right? Meaning that when you design a field release, right, you, you, you say, okay, I let one person to stand at the release center and release that many mosquitoes. And I ask another person like, 20 meters away from, from where I stand and release that many mosquitoes. And then if we can, we can construct this front, right? So we know that this is not practical. Um, however, we do see that the critical bubble give us a nice reference shape for designing an efficient release. So if we look at the area curves here, right? The, the, 
the, the sweet spot happens either around with 30 or with 40 for the, this is for the triangular case. And if we look at the step curves here, the 30 with 30 is around here. So it's kind of mimic the width of the bubble. For the triangle case, the optimal is 40. So it's like this curve here. It's, so it's like, you cannot be too narrow. You cannot be too flat, right? And then you want to hit the 40 here that is trying to be, mimic the width of the bubble. And here, this is 30, that's this ellipse here. So the, 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 the insight will be when we design the, um, the field release um, strategy, right? It may be worthwhile to design a strategy that's practical and that is trying to mimic the optimal distribution that we identify here. Okay, so um, this example is, is a numerical simulation trying to further infer some um, design strategy. So when we do the field release, we probably always aim above the threshold level, right? And if we only like release just above the threshold level, it may take forever for the infection to be established and then propagates and cover the area. So we wonder like, what is the optimal infection level for my field release? Right, so we can consider the time to uh, establish an invasion that's related to the, the time cost of the program. We also want to consider the, uh, the total amount of infected mosquitoes to be released. That is also related to the cost of the program and it's also associated with the capacity of the lab that's create, that, that creates these uh, infected mosquitoes. So on the left, this is uh, showing the minimal amount of time needed um, for uh, uh, is establishing a stable infection. So on the x-axis, this is where I, um, this is just an index measuring the, um, the magnitude of the release. So if I increase the release size here from two to six, we see that the time, the minimum amount of time needed is decreasing, right? So this is kind of expected, and this is true for different um, diffusion ratio here. On the right, so I'm varying the release size from small to large. So we see that the, uh, the release number first decrease here and then it bounces back. So we say that for the field release, we probably want to aim for this optimal region here. So among, um, uh, within this region, right, we enjoy this sharp reduction in the time needed for the release. And we, are, we, don't, we can cut down our cost, like the number of mosquitoes we released. And up here, when we release, we, when we do a large field release, right, we release tons of mosquitoes here, we see that it only have this marginal improvement in terms of the time that, um, that it cut down. Uh, and it creates like, it needs lots of mosquitoes here. So there's lots of waste here in terms of the mosquitoes that we release. So we suspect that this is because this waste comes from the current capacity constraint. Right? So imagine you, you do field release at one spot and then you release lots of infected mosquitoes. And these released infected mosquitoes, they are competing with each other and they are also competing with the natural mosquitoes into the field. Like they're competing for human bites, they're competing for uh, food or the environment or the natural resources. So they, lots of these released uh, mosquitoes, they're kind of killed by the current capacity before they're able to carry the infection and transmit to the nearby region. So this is like the waste for scenario. So just to uh, summarize the, uh, what I've discussed here. So for, for this talk, we um, try to capture a threshold condition for Wolbachia invasion in mosquitoes, right? So we studied that using models of different complexity. So we have a full model, we do the reduced model, we introduce our spatial model based on the reduced model. So our threshold condition is updated from a single number here to a distribution curve um, that is our critical bubble. And we compare the bubble um, shape with other release shapes here. Right. Just if I have 
time here. Um, I'll just touch a bit on the future work of the project. So we know that, well, we, uh, yeah, Dr. Wu, I'm, I'm, I'm not good on time. No, I'm checking that, yes, you know, you do have time. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, I'll do it quickly. So, um, so we, we know that we have this spatial model, right? And we, we, we know that we cannot be too, have too much confidence in the model yet. The reason is when, when we do the field release, we, we don't release the mosquito online, right? Like our step release. It's we, we need to release in the two dimensional plane here. So for example, if you release the mosquito at a point, right? And then the mosquitoes, they're dispersing, they're flying uh, in the cylindrical symmetric way, for example. Or you can consider a full two dimensional case. So a preliminary results that we identify uh, just by having this um, cylindrical symmetric term for the diffusion. This is our, on the left, this is our bubble uh, in this uh, semi two-dimensional two case. So we, when we compare this 2D bubble with our 1D bubble that uh, I showed you before. So the, on the right, this top red curve is the cross-section of my 2D bubble. The blue dashed line is my 1D bubble. So we already see that the 2D bubble is much higher in terms of its infection rate at the center and it's much steeper. So this already suggests that we still have something to, to understand uh, for, to, before we can apply this a model for simulating the field release. So this is the roadmap. Right, so we, we are here, we want to study our symmetric symmetric and our ultimate goal is to uh, study a full spatial model that's able to um, inform the more complex field release. Right? And in terms of that, we can, um, in the, for simulating the field release, we can say how we can combine the Wubakia strategy with some pre-release mitigation approach. So for example, if you consider the bubble here, it's like the infection rate needs to be around 60%. And that's a very high infection rate if you talk about um, the amount of mosquito need, need to release. So what people often do is they first kill lots of uninfected mosquitoes and then they release the infection and that will be a more efficient way. Right? We can also consider how the seasonality play a role here right? and different construction in the spatial term. Uh, last but not least, I want to acknowledge uh, the wonderful people that I have worked collaborate with on this project. So we have modelers here on the top and we have our mosquito experts in the bottom and they keep us on track, like they keep us on track with all the mosquito knowledge that we need to um, be aware of. And then I want to acknowledge the funding support here and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chu. And um, uh, actually, stay on this picture. I would like to know some of the names <laughs> from, from you, from you, uh, biology collaborators. Uh, who's yeah, the uh, actually? I'm so sorry. You, you mean the what these two people? The name for these yeah, two yeah, people? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. That that's Pamping and Don Watson. All right. Yes. Don, so Pamping yes. is. Pampin is now, uh, she was a postdoc. Um, yeah, she was a postdoc at California Academy of Science when we started this project. And now she just moved on to a faculty position at this lab. And then uh, Dr. Dawn Weston, uh, she's uh, from Tulane University. Now I remember Dr. Uh, Weston uh, when I was in Tulane. Uh, that's yeah. why I was wondering. Now I have a mathematical program. So it's a very nice little talk. Thank you very much. Um, you already mentioned about time, timely releasing and optimal timing. And uh, in this part of the world, our part of the world, um, it, it's a highly seasonal. Uh, and uh, mosquito generation uh, really is our lab of generations. Uh, and you're talking about genetic control. So, uh, so what would be happens if you incorporate in time periodicity? And would your two-dimensional model still be good uh, approximation with that high-dimensional model? You're saying like we have this, for example, an impulsive release term in the model? 
Well, I don't know if it should have been pause attempt, but I know the the mosquito uh, host interaction is seasonal because in, mm. in, 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 in this part it's difficult to find to you from to land from Texas. And mm -hmm. it's highly seasonal. So it's really a oh. model prime that periodic mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the definitely our 2PD model is not good if you talk about seasonality. So mm -hmm. for example, in a very cold area, uh, the mosquito they like the eggs in the water, it's much longer for them to grow and develop, become adults, right? And then right. for that, right. you would need to like go back to the nine ODE model, like, and then do the extension based mm -hmm. on that. And probably you want to further uh, uh, split the aquatic stage, say to the egg and larvae slash pupae stage. Mm -hmm. So to incorporate right. that, so, that temperature change. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm afraid. You cannot have the quasi equilibrium approximation. Then oh. you, you will end up with yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So, that's so my... that's why, like, we say, okay, we want to start from sim the simplest case, like the two equation scenario, right. and then ultimately right. we still need to go back and apply, right. say, the tools that we learned from these baby examples to the more complex uh, scenario with, with like a full description of the life cycles. Right. It's very impressive. The first time I see such a comprehensive and systematic study of uh, issues that has both mathematics and uh, the relevance to, to biology and epidemiology. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chu. Other questions from, from, the, uh, the, from the audience? Why, um, James, um, the mother is not smiling on the face? Why should we? Why should we smile? It's mathematics is so complicated. Serious business. <laughs> no, it's serious business. Oh, so you're seeing the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the pictures look so serious. You, you should check with Mark Hyman. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, I was curious if you tried to simulate the PDE for the full nine uh, variable system. Does, did you do the did you do the numerical simulations on the nine variable PDE model or just on the two? You did. Uh, we are currently uh, make our way back, so we okay. have two PDE and then we do the four PDE and then we will do actually not the nine because we are not really satisfied with the design of the original nine. So we propose like another uh, like an okay. eight or eight PDE system. Yeah, it will be uh, done numerically. Yeah, I was kind of curious if the because the removing the uh, larvae juvenile stage that's a presumably stationary sessile not moving right so and, for and, the then you change the delay right which doesn't change the equilibrium but it would change the i thought that might interact with the spatial like the delay uh the delay while they're stationary and become before they uh emerge and mate might interact with the uh, diffusion term in some interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so for the complete model, like we, um, <coughs> that, you know, maybe um, capable to have a seasonality effect is that mm. I, we have male and female, they are there. And then we have the egg stages and we have the larvae and pupae maybe combined as a stage. So, and then the aquatic stage mosquito, they don't diffuse. <laughs> they, yeah. They're just ODE, mm -hmm. like in some sense. And then we have the, only the adults, they have the diffusion term there. So, uh, Julian, I, I assume you know that in Guangzhou, they started massive uh, field. Yeah, yeah, field, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Control using this. Yeah, and I actually present this once at. Uh, I think there's a group of mass bio people. They also study this uh, Wobakia release, uh, and I think in Guangzhou the the strategy they implement this Wobakia is called. Um, they're more on the SIT fashion. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they, they they instead of doing this population invasion or population replacement. They're doing population right. suppression. All right. Thank yeah. you.
Do we have a question? And that's the last question. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. So I was just wondering if you're planning to incorporate human dynamics into the model. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So I think um, in order to do that, like you were suspect substantially increase the size of the system, right? So um, like we already have that for mosquito, like that's like eight equation. And then you want to couple that with the transmission dynamic, say dengue virus in human and how they interact with each other, right? So we're talking about say dozens of equations at least. So um, yeah, that, that could be done, but like we probably need to simplify the mosquito side a bit so um, so that the system size is more manageable. Um, and I think if you're interested uh, in that, I think uh, Dr. Lin Xue, the, let me, she did some nice work. Dr. Lin Xue here, uh, she did some work like doing the coupled system with um, like where the mosquito side is only infected and non-infected. So it's like a more simplified description on the mosquito system and couple that with the human uh, dynamic. Yeah, that will be like. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to say Mike Hyman's smile, that's his best smile. So, uh, <laughs> so James, I want to correct that. So thank you very much. With that final note, I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Chu, for coming and to start our uh, network scrutiny in areas rather than just the uh, COVID-19 and move on to workbound diseases and others. Thank you very much again. I, I want really to, appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>